All right, I, it looks like we are good to go. Welcome everybody to the Wednesday morning session. This is a session on anions and fault tolerant quantum computation. Uh, and the first talk is by Guillaume Dauphiné, as joint work with David Poulon, and the title is Fault Tolerant Error Correction for Non-Abelian Anions. All right, is this mic working? You hear me? Yes? All right, so I'm very glad to be here so I can present this work, just a joint work with David Poulain about error corrections and uh, false error corrections for non abelian anions. So uh, first of all, I will very briefly describe some key features about anions and why we actually care about them in uh, quantum computations. Uh, then I will talk about error corrections for the case where the anions are abelian, so we actually know quite a bit about this because uh, you know, it's very well related to the Turek code, and it seems like a very good starting point to generalize it to the case where the excitations are non-abelian. Um, so we're going to work on a two-dimensional surface that will be evolving in time, and so this system is, is characterized by ex um, excitations which are localized in space, so they have a well-defined position, and they are gapped, meaning that uh, it, there's some energy cost associated, associated with the fact of creating them. So each of these excitations can be assigned a label, which we call its topological charge. And you know, there's a finite set of labels, which depends on the model that you're con considering. Um, typically, we call uh, the charge one or the vacuum just the absence of excitation. And um, these labels cannot be modified by any small local operators. And so uh, we can ask the questions, well, let's say we have two anions of charge, let's say A and B. What happens if we compose this object? If we bring this object together, we fuse them, and we look at what is the resulting charge. And so uh, charge C. And so these, the possibilities that you get are given essentially by the fusion rules, which are typically written as you know, A cross B, meaning we fuse A with B. And then there's a list of the possible outcomes that can give, given by these N matrices. Uh, so there's two general class of anions, the abelian ones and non-abelian. So for the abelian ones, these fusion rules essentially always have only one single possibility, meaning that when you fuse two uh, different anions, uh, you always know uh, deterministically what will be the resulting charges. An example of that is the excitations of the Turek code. Right? So it, regardless of what the state of the system is, when we bring two of these excitations, we already always know what's going to happen. Uh, in contrast, there's a more exotic particles, the non-abelian anions. Uh, in this case, there are some uh, fusion. Uh, fusing two particles may have more than one fusion channels. For example, the Fibonacci anions, if you bring two of these excitations uh, labeled by tau, well, they can either cancel each other and you go back to the vacuum, or you can have, they can just fuse to a single uh, Fibonacci anions. And so you can read these rules as fusion rules, but you can also read them as fission rules in the other direction. So you can, for example, create from the vacuum a pair of excitations, or you can take a single uh, Fibonacci anions and split it into two. Um, and so there's an Hilbert space associated with this fusion or uh, splitting processes. And if you have a set of anions and you ask what is their total charge, it's essentially just given by the Born's rule, right? So in, uh, in general, it's going to be some probability of fusing to a total charge. And so why do we care about these guys in uh, quantum information? Uh, we can essentially use these guys to do some quantum computations. Um, so the main idea is that we start from, let's say, the vacuum state, so we don't have any excitations, and then we create pairs of excitation. So we encode our qubits in this uh, fusion space associated with these non anions. And then once we have these excitations, we can braid them, so move them around each other and keep, 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 keeping them far apart. And this will apply at some gates. So the, the fact of braiding them will have some non trivial effect on the fusion space. Uh, and once we have applied all our gates, you know, all the, the, the gates on the circuits. Uh, will, will correspond to some sequence of braidings, we can bring pairs of anions together, fuse them, and observe what is the, uh, the, the resulting charge. And the, one of the interests of this, this model of computation is that um, it's insensitive to the details, meaning that the, the braiding, the gates that we apply, depend only on the topology of the space-time trajectory of these anions, so how they're braided, and not on the details of how they uh, are braided. So that seems like a quite robust uh, scheme. However, there are some processes that can 
uh, corrupt the, your computation, right? So you can imagine, for example, that your system is coupled to some bath, and you may have the presence of uh, thermal excitation that appear in your system. Um, if you don't check them around, these guys can be created. There's an energy cost associated with that, but once they're created, these excitation can diffuse uh, with essentially no, no energy cost, and they can uh, you know, do some non-trivial braiding with your computational anions, you can have some fusion processes, and all this can, uh, you know, mess with the computation you're trying to do, and you end up not, not, not doing the right thing. Um, and, and you could argue that you could try to lower the temperature as much as you like to try to reduce the probability that you have some excitations, but it really is a scalability issue. Once you start to want to have a large computation, we have some finite density of these stations that are going to be around. So you need some way to deal with them so that they will not corrupt the, what you're trying to do. And so our goal is to essentially find some error correction procedure for a system that gives rise to non-abelian anions. So there's a, a few papers that uh, study this problem. Um, however, none of them consider the possibility of having some measurement errors in them. And so we want to include measurement errors since it's, you know, it's going to happen in real life as well. And this is quite a serious complication for the case of non-abelian anions. And a good starting point looks like uh, topologically ordered anions, have, uh, topologically ordered system have been studied extensively. Uh, they're related to the Turek code, and these guys give rise to abelian anions. And so it starts like a, it looks like a good starting point in order to try to generalize some of these methods to use it for the non-abelian case. Uh, so I uh, will just say a few words about topological order. So imagine here that we live on a torus, so the boundaries are uh, identified. And so we have a degenerate ground space, and we can use this degenerate ground space to encode informations. And logical operators are essentially uh, as follows. You can imagine applying a local operator uh, to create a pair of excitations from the vacuum. You can then displace by a series of local operations uh, one of the partners, say, around this uh, vertical line. So you do a non-logically non-trivial loop with this particle and you fuse it back with uh, its partner. So you are back to the ground space, uh, but you have applied this non-trivial homologically operation and this actually applies some operation on the ground space. And say if it's a unwanted process, it's let's say a thermal process you didn't take, uh, take notice of, it would really corrupt your information. And these operations, the only thing that matters, is, again, is the topology, so you can deform them in a continuous manner and that would not change their effect. Um, and so the way we study, so we're gonna be studying at discrete model, uh, models and we living on lattice, so every site essentially can contain some topological charges, and we model thermal processes by some probabilistic model. So we pick at random some edges, um, and we create anions, so these errors, on the sites connected with these edges. So once you have created these errors, you can measure the charges in the different sites, um, and you can do it in a faulty way, meaning that uh, you can have measurement errors, uh, you know, measure ghost defects or miss um, charges, or you can have to, uh, measure the wrong char topological charges. And uh, you feed this configuration of information to a decoder. The job of the decoder is to find some operator that's gonna essentially pair these anions together so that, and give you some operations to make them fuse back together. Right? And you apply these operations, and you hope that the total process of error creations and uh, recovery procedure is not going to apply any homologically non-trivial loop on your uh, subspace to make sure that you don't corrupt the information that you have encoded. And so um, one of the key features that we're interested in these uh, decoder is the existence of thresholds. So just to illustrate what I mean by that. So imagine on the x-axis of this graph, you have a measure of the strength of the, the, the noise, so and essentially the rate of creation of excitations. And on the y-axis is after you have applied this noise process plus recovery, what's the probability that you, you have applied a, non -local, uh, a logical operation on a ground space? So, and you can repeat this same algorithm, let's say, for a system of different sizes. So you can see that on the I error regime, on the I rate of creations, uh, if you have a larger system, you actually have a higher 
probability of, of, of making a, a logical error in the system. While on the lower end of the spectrum, if you have a very low particle rate, increasing the system size is going to help you reduce the logical error rate. And in fact, you can you know, get an arbitrary low uh, logical error rate by simply increasing the system size. And the point where these uh, curves cross is, is the, the threshold. So you want to, uh, to operate between, uh, below this critical uh, error rate creation. Um, so for a Tarakog, there exists quite a few different uh, decoding algorithms. I'm not going to, to go through all of them, but I will mention specifically uh, a scheme developed by, uh, proposed by Jim Arrington in his thesis, which uses the idea of serotomaton and immunization method that uh, generalized quite well for the case where we have non-abelian aneats. And so uh, a word on what is a serotomaton. So essentially, we imagine that we have an array of uh, small local uh, classical devices that have access to a small neighborhood, so a few sites. So in our case, it's going to be a set of three by three sites. And these devices will peri periodically in time. So, so our nose model is essentially we have, at every time step, we first create noises, so create charge. Then the serotomatons are going to measure the charges. And based on the measurements that they, uh, that they perform, so which, which can be faulty, so we applied some predetermined local operations. Right? And these uh, serotomatons can communicate uh, with their neighbors via local uh, communications. And you can actually have some uh, memory in this space, so they can remember some measurements on previous time steps. And they can actually have some, have some more complex sets of instructions that essentially allow them to synchronize uh, periodically in time and to apply some operations on a larger scale than simply their local neighborhood. Um, so, with the kind of probabilistic noise model that we study, there's actually some uh, emerging structure that happens if the error rate is probability is low enough. And so we can, uh, here the example is just 2D, but we imagine that we have a 3D structure. So we have a 2D lattice, but we have, that's going to be evolving in time. We have our uh, charge errors, which are just creating a station on the uh, horizontal edges and vertical edges just represent measurement errors. And so the point is you can classify the individual error in sets of actual errors of level n. So they're characterized by some integer number. And an actual error of level n is essentially fits in a box which is exponentially large from n and it is which is well separated from all other actual errors of the same level or, or higher. And so the, the actual definition of this, this construction is quite complex and is, is actually done recursively. So I will not go through all the details, but just as an example. So imagine that we have uh, our 2D square lattice where the black uh, squares just represent you know, errors happening. So we start by defining our level zero errors, which are error, small errors that fit in box, let's say two, uh, two by two, and that are separated of any other errors. So we find that these guys are all uh, forming some actual level zero errors. Once we have identified them, we just imagine, okay, let's imagine that they're not there, and then we pass to the next level. So we look at boxes which are bigger. In this case, I chose five by five, and that are well separated from each other. And we find that these two guys are fits this description. Uh, the, the, the black ones do not because they're either too large if you take them together, or if they take them separately, they're too close together. Right? And you keep keep going up like this, identify recursively on, on the, the levels, the, the, the different actual errors. And very importantly, the probability of having a level n actual error drops double exponentially with the level n. Right? And you have this emerging structure as long as the error rate is below some certain uh, critical uh, value. Right. Um, so what's Harrington's basic ideas for, for his cellular automaton? So um, we know that first we are going to deal with the level zero errors. They have apply on a very small local error. Uh, you know, they, they are contained in a small box, right? So this green guy, for example. And so they're so small that they can, all the excitations created by these errors can actually be detected by a single cellular automaton. And so we just define the local rules to be such that we are sure that all the excitation created are going to be you know, concentrated in a single site in this small neighborhood. And by just charge conservation, they will go back to the vacuum. 
right? You can also have some measurement errors. In this case, you would just try to displace an extension, let's say, that's not there if it's a closed defect, and the effect of that would be to create a pair of extension, but at the next time step, you, would, you cannot have uh, measurement errors because these are well isolated in time as well as in space, and so these errors would be, uh, you know, corrected at the next time steps. So, of course, uh, you have a lower probability, but still it's non-zero to have longer chain of errors. Let's say this red guy is a level one actual error. So in this case, um, you know, uh, the cellular automaton around an excitation, one of the endpoints, would only have, doesn't have, doesn't know where the other partner is. So we just detect a single excitation. So to, to deal with that, we structure, we, we define a structure, a colony structure, and if an excitation is isolated from the other, the, the rules of the cellular automaton are essentially designed so that this anion will slowly be displaced toward the center of the colony. So if your chain is contained in a single colony, the endpoints are going to drift toward the colony center, where they essentially would just fuse to the vacuum and correct the error. So, um, of course, nothing tells you that this chain of error is not going to span over more than one colony, right? So in this case, if you have this blue chain of error, well, each of the endpoints is just going to drift toward their respective colony center. And then if that's all you do, they will just stay there uh, forever, right? Where they can interact with other errors that would happen in the end. So to deal with that, periodically in time, uh, these colonies are essentially going to regroup themselves, so the automata are going to synchronize themselves and form a renormalized, uh, you know, essentially form a renormalized colony and apply some renormalized transition rule, which is essentially acting at the same way at this level than the, the, the local, like, serotomaton is acting at the physical level, right? So eventually, after being stuck in their colony centers for a certain amount of time, uh, these serotomaton will detect, okay, we have some non-trivial charge that has been sitting here, and it would apply some transition rules that would bring uh, the union from one colony center towards the uh, neighboring colony by a series of local operations. And so, um, using these ideas, Arrington can show that uh, at level n actual errors always will stay local at this renized level in space, um, actually, the, 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 the application of these renormalized transition rules are going to be able to correct the error, so bring back all the excitations to a single point and fuse them to the vacuum. And it actually is a process that is fast enough so that you know, the, the, the excitation created by different actual errors of this level are going to be set well separated in space and in time. Right? And if you combine that with the fact that uh, we know that the probability of having a level n actual errors drops double exponentially with n, and we find that there's a threshold because remember that to apply some non-trivial operation on the logical subspace, we, we need to have an, an actual error of level i enough to cover the whole system. Right, so by increasing the size system, you just decrease the probability of having such an error. And so it, because these are applying with local rules or automata, and it seems like quite straightforward to just generalize a case where we have non-abelian Indians. However, when you try to analyze this case, uh, lots of complication arises from the non-trivial breeding and fusion relationships that we have for the non-abelian guys. So uh, the first thing is that even if you imagine that you have your a picture of your 3D uh, space and time of view and uh, 3D plus time, and you know exactly what errors affect which sites, it's not possible to deterministically predict what is going to be the state of the system under the evolution of these uh, transition rules because of the uh, deterministic, uh, non-deterministic uh, fusion rules, right? So we really need to introduce the notion of a trajectory domain of errors, which are roughly sets of sites which have some probability of being coming charged because some error happened. Um, we also need to be able to have a notion, we have a notion of renormalized charge in, in, in this in automaton, this but it becomes very tricky for non-abelian Indians. So if you have a set of abelian Indians in, in a physical space, well, and, and you know their labels, their charge, you know 
what is going to be their total charge. But for non-abelian unions, um, you don't actually know deterministic what it is. You actually need to bring these guys together to fuse them and then to observe, okay, this is the charge that I observe. Um, but however, because of the non-trivial braiding relationships, um, this process is actually path dependent because you can imagine that you have a small cloud of errors and depending on if, uh, uh, happening in, your, in between where the, the, the colony center and where your anions part of level one actual errors are going to be uh, concentrated, depending if you go through these clouds or around it, this can change the, the fusion channels. And so this is, defining a notion of Brunoris charge is, is quite tricky in the case, in the non-abelian case. And I would say that maybe the deepest consequence is, is the fact that it becomes impossible to actually treat these actual errors independently. So uh, just to illustrate this concept, so imagine we have a long chain of errors, some high level actual errors that happens. The charge have been well concentrated on the center of their colony and you are at a time where you will apply some transition rules that just transport some anion to, from one center, colony center to its neighboring colony center. So th this actual, this classification of actual errors does not prevent the appearance of a small cloud of uh, low level errors that happens on the path of the anions being displaced towards you know, the, the colony, nearest colony center. And because we have some non-trivial braiding relationships that affect the fusion space, um, after passing through this cloud of errors, you know, the fusion states, the, these anions become entangled, so their fusion states are not independent anymore. And in fact, it can make fail the application of the transition rule. So after moving the right charge outside the colony, because of these braiding, you may have some non-trivial charge present in the original colony. Right, so now the situation is, you don't have a set of different actual level errors which are independent of each other, but you have actual errors of different levels which all interact together, right? So things get quite messy quite. And so we need to introduce the notion of a causal link clusters, which are essentially sets of actual errors, which can potentially, so remember that everything is probabilistic, which can potentially interact with each other. Um, and, and this is because we apply these transition rules of the serial automaton. And so, um, despite all these complications, we were able to identify a family of anions, non-cyclic anions, which are in general non-abelian, so they include abelian anions, but other non-abelian like Ising, for example. And um, essentially for these guys, uh, you can f prove that, again, uh, a level N causally in cluster, so essentially the level of a causally in cluster is just the level of the largest error in the cluster, they stay local at this renormalized level. Um, the actual notion of renormalized charge or syndrome actually makes sense for these anions under the evolution of our uh, this cellular automata. Um, and the, the defining, uh, I would say, characteristic of the non-cyclic anions is that you can prove that after applying at most a finite number of times these uh, transition rules, even if there are some clouds of non-abelian anions that happens on its path, uh, this, this, this transition rule will essentially will be successful, right? And we can find, it, we know what this constant number of time is. It's just a simple function of the, uh, the fusion rules of the model. And so here's a, a, the definitions in terms of the fusion rules for these anions. I'm not gonna go through the detail, but essentially that's just what I said, written in equations. And so, um, even if you have all these new mechanisms of braiding and interaction between these different levels of actual errors for the non-cyclic anions, we can prove the existence of a, a threshold. And as long as the error rate is low enough so that this original structure of actual errors uh, can hold, you will be able to uh, encode information and keep it in memory for uh, an arbitrary large time just by increasing the system size. Um, actually, we can do a bit more than that. We can find some numerical values for this threshold. Um, so our analytical arguments gives a very, very low value, 10 to the minus 20. This is really just some, some existent 
existence proof. And, but this is done by considering the, essentially the worst possible case of errors and finding parameters for the, the, the algorithm that's going to work even in that case. Um, but we have you know, strong reasons to believe that the, the, the typical errors is, is quite far from the worst possible case. So we perform some numerical simulations using Ising anions, which is a type of non-Ambelian anions, which is non-cyclic as well. So on the x-axis, we have just the particle rate reaction. Uh, this includes uh, measurement errors. So we have measurement errors as well in these simulations. And on the y-axis is essentially an average memory lifetime. So how long can we keep the information? So how long it takes before the information that's in the ground states become, uh, we cannot recover it. Assuming that at some point, at some time, we just stop the error rate and have some perfect measurements and apply some algorithm to that, that, that was all previously known for these system. And so, uh, and we do that for different system size, labeled by n, and it's just the, you know, the number of different layers that we have. So our unit cells is three by three. So and so we go to size of up 81 by 81, and three to the four times three to the four. And so what we see is that, um, so there's an, a region between 10 to the minus four, a bit below 10 to the minus three, where, you know, larger system keeps memory time much larger. So our our threshold seems like it's much closer to, let's say, a bit lower than 10 to the minus 3, between 10 to the minus 1 and 10 to the minus 3, than this 10 to the minus 21 that, or 20 that, that we actually have with the analytical arguments. Um, so this, this work can be extended in many different directions. So first of all, what can we say about cyclic anions? Because this, the application of transition rules can fail, uh, you know, over and over and over again, things becomes much more difficult to analyze because not only can it, can it prevent the high level transition rules to correct the long chains, but this of course asks that all the levels from the or lower are considered correctly. So if all the rules fail at all the levels, it becomes a much more difficult problem to handle. Um, and these models include, for example, Fibonacci's. Um, so we, we treated the case where we were working in a torus. Of course, a more uh, experimentally relevant case would be the case where you know, we actually have these computational Indians on a plane. So how do we adapt our algorithm to, to, to do this? It's quite, uh, I could quite envision that, but I haven't worked out the details. Um, and I just talked to you about some memory, right? I, didn't have, I have not applied any breedings, any gates, so it would be interesting to see if it's possible to adapt this kind of ideas to the case where we actually have some breedings or or if we need to develop some different methods. And uh, with that, I will thank you for your attention and be happy to ask any questions. Questions? Oh, yeah, I, I saw an arm there. Vadim. Hello. Um, Hi. So I have one question. Is uh, the cyclic condition um, how it is related to universality of any model. So is, it, uh, conf is there an example of models that is universal for quantum computing and um, uh, non-cyclic? So yes, so I think it's related. Uh, so, if it, so all the non-cyclic Indians models that I know, I haven't found some, some model which I know is universal for quantum computation, you know, using only braidings. I mean, that is non-cyclic. Uh, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. But I, but I think that there's a link. Uh, essentially, the non-cyclic the non conditions put restrictions on the quantum dimensions uh, because, well, you know, they can be found at the eigenvalues of, of these n matrices, and so it puts some con constraints on them. But the, these constraints is quite, uh, quite hard to deal with, and I, I haven't looked at the linked. And so, like, there's this F conjecture, mm -hmm. which if the quantum dimension of the unions is, I think, the square root of uh, an integer, then the model has to be, is not good for computational, but uh, I, I did look a, bit, a little bit along this line, but I haven't found uh, a strict condition. So I think there's a, there's a link, but I don't know yet what it is for so, sure. So did you, did you check SU2 level K models, or did you rule them out or away, all SU2 yeah, level K? Uh, I mean, did you rule out um, all SU2 level K models uh, kind of uh, above certain K as being uh, 
So yeah, so uh, the SU2K, there's just a, essentially they're just Ising, which is not cyclic, I think. Okay. The other ones are, are cyclic. Okay, yeah. thank you. Hector? So, from your graph, the, so you were showing that there is, oh, you were talking about a memory lifetime. So I understand that you are doing noisy error correction. I, yes. I hope I understand it well. Okay. So are you taking into account the fact that Donabile and Anions can only move at finite speed? So this is one of the approximation we did. We, we, we assume for just for simplifying a bit that we can apply these, uh, you know, in a single time steps. But this is, yeah, so this is a physical fundamental yeah, thing so you cannot. But this was to simplify a bit the analysis. So like we, we, we see no, I mean, so we don't see any, uh, so things get just a little bit complicated, uh, more complicated to simulate or to, to deal with. But, uh, yeah, so, but we don't see any, any reason to see that it cannot be applied. So we could, could apply it just step by step, but it requires changing the local rules in a complicated matter. It's just technically more challenging, but we don't see any, we don't have any reason to believe that it would change things drastically. Hi. Hi. So, thanks for the talk. Um, so you're saying the threshold is somewhere in that region of, well, like, yeah, order of magnitude. It, yes. And so all, all the data that I've seen for cellular automata, whenever you go to larger lattice sizes, the kind of crossings drift towards the left, including data that we've come up with ourselves. And it's, it seems to be quite hard to get out the regime where well, you have these finite size effects. So, so can you zoom into that? Because my eyes are a bit blurry. So oh. how close are the crossings? Well, I, I have a bit of problem with my computer. We can, maybe I can come and zoom it with you, but... Uh, ah. I don't see what I'm doing. Let me... I mean, maybe you can describe it. So how you've got two lines that cross and then another crossing slightly to the right, is it? Yeah, so the larger how seems to cross a bit higher, yeah. Um, so the larger seems to cross a bit, to go a bit higher, but they get closer and closer. So, I mean, the lattice size we, we simulate is essentially three by three because of this exponential like flow up. It's really hard, even if you, we go to a unit size five by five uh, already for this calling structure, I mean, we can simulate even three, three levels is not something we can simulate. It's 125 by 125. So I think there's a lot of like finite size effect in there. Um, so, because if you think about it, three by three is a bit weird because, I mean, a single solar automaton has access to the whole colony, so we would really like to go larger and larger, but it's really hard to, to, to simulate just because of this blow up. But we have an ethical argument that says, like, you know, there's like a threshold, uh, you know, a solid threshold. This is low value, but this is the evidence here. So, yeah. So, with these kinds, of, that's always something I observe. Also, there seems to be some, some drifting, but we can we can plot the uh, you know the asymptotic region here, so the the the, the field curves, I mean the the solid curves are 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 polynomials of the form p to the minus two to the n, just like the, the error rate that we expect. And in the in the asymptotic region, this there they fit quite well. But yeah, well, what we'd like to have to larger lattices to try to see if they, you know, if this drifting effect just is some finite size effect. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay, if, if I may ask a question. Yes. So uh, I think on one of your slides, you were talking about moving anions from one center of a colony to a neighboring yes. center of a colony. So that seems a physical process to me, and you said it's causing trouble. It make, it's making things more complicated. Yeah, because you can have some... Okay, yeah, so now let's some. talk about the simpler case of error correction with the Tori code. Yes. So there, you would just measure a syndrome. You would never do an error correction. You would just take note of what's going to happen. Yeah. And, well, that saves you operations, and that helps with the error threshold in the end. Could you do something like that in your case as well, or do you have to physically 
move these well, guys? So the problem is you cannot predict in general what, what they will fuse to. So mm -hmm. I really think that you have to move these guys together to, to observe what is their uh, okay. fusion outcome because then you will most likely have to perform some other operation based on what is the measurement okay. that you have sorry. Thanks. <coughs> okay, so if there's no further question, uh, let's uh, thank our first speaker again. <laughs>